What does one need to be a, a good artistic director? What qualities? Well, you need to read the literature very widely. You need to be well educated in the theatre. A good idea, a good notion of, 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 of all theatres as much as you can encompass, certainly of Western theatre from its origins right through. So a good academic understanding or literary understanding of theatre is essential. I, I think a deep commitment to the art form. You must love being on the stage. You must love seeing live theatre. It must excite something in you. Uh, you must like actors and theatre people well enough to, to survive them, to live with them. And they're not always my first choice of companion. But I like, them, not, I like them well enough to work with them. I don't think any one professional group is commendable. I think collectivities of doctors or architects, when you get into them as a collectivity, are pretty miserable. Uh, lawyers, you know. Artistic directors. Uh, even. I could never get artistic directors to speak to each other. You know it packed. I would try every year to get them to speak to us. They would, it never succeeded. Artistic directors are the most afraid that there is something in them will be lost if they share this with another artistic director to elucidate, to articulate what, what they really, really want. It was a very difficult thing, and I never really achieved that. It was something I wanted in pact. No, I never achieved that. So, well, sharing vision amongst sharing the vision. artistic directors? Honestly and fully and comprehensively, no. I never saw that done. In a way, they're protecting, no, but in a way you can understand it too because they're protecting some wellspring that they don't fully understand. And by trying to articulate it, you might be reducing it. It might be a reductive activity. So let it be there, unspoken, to replenish you from some source that you can't understand. Let it be. Uh, I can see uh, one reason for all of that. Now, there's something that just comes to mind that I must mention. We talk about the birth of French-Canadian theatre, and it's often a, a thing that is raised in Quebec as an argument against the rest of Canada, that they created something which we do not understand, we are only belatedly catching up with. And it's been sort of a, a flag in Quebec. And in one respect, very justifiably, it is a what they've created is rare, unusual, magical, and so on. But you know who started all that was the Canada Council, and it's forgotten. Um, the politic in, in French Canadian theatre when I arrived was intensely political. English people were rough as buffoons on the stage, and it was, it was fairly pedantic. Some of the work was good, but it wasn't world class. So then when the, when the, and this is the history now, I'm telling you. When the Levesque government came into being... 1960... Yeah, the early 60s. They called for a colloquium of the established Quebec theatres to meet every month with their representative to see how we would advance the cause of Quebec theatre in the matter of the democratization of the arts, the, uh, the bringing in of new talent, in other words, spreading it out beyond Montreal and Quebec City, all the things that you would think would be healthy impulses. They were resisted by almost every French-Canadian artistic director, except the Centaur, who became allies of the Parti Québécois at that particular moment. We were the ones who agreed absolutely with, with what they were trying to promote. The others rejected entirely any political direction uh, and spoke, they used the word dirigisme, which is a very unflattering French-Canadian word for interference. And you leave me alone. And in the first few years of the, of the Levesque regime, the French-Canadian theatres resorted to traditional uh, uh, playmaking. They were doing their Molières, their Racines, all of that, with great appetite. And, and the the youngsters had nowhere to, to go. The Canada Council, in its wisdom, the French sector of the Canada Council, decided that they could give grants to individual artists. This was unheard of. Previously, they'd only given it to companies. You had to have a company, you had to have a, 
uh, board of directors, you have to have the whole establishment. We're talking 1960s. Yeah. They decided that to promote the development of a new French-Canadian theatre, they would support individual artists. And the Théâtre de la Man Manufacture and all those groups came out of that wisdom, that generosity of the County Council. As soon as they started doing good works, the established companies in, in Quebec took on those players. And so a new synthesis, a new wave, what we now recognize as the Quebec Theatre, took place. But the Canada Council is owed a huge debt and they don't often acknowledge that. No, uh, it's a, is it myth or, or truth? Uh, English Canada has always believed that the Quebec funding for the arts was far superior than in Ontario or Saskatchewan or BC. Mm. Well, we were well funded by the Parti Québécois. Um, uh, some people said it was a form of tokenism. I don't think so. I think the Quebec cabinet was very culturally minded and generous. There was a nice little instance when Levesque was giving a lecture at McGill and somebody asked him, would he support English cultural organizations? He said, ah, may we? We give money to the Neptune Theatre. And this was reported in the paper the next day. And so I wrote to him and I said, on behalf of the people of, 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 of uh, Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. I want to thank you very much for your support of the Neptune Theatre. But you know, there's the Centaur Theatre in Montreal. You should support them also. So he wrote me back. He said, "Ah, you know, these, 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 these grand old beasts. You know, Centaurs and Neptunes. You get them easily mixed up." He said, "But of course, we support you." And they did. Yeah, they did. They did. Uh, yeah, not as generously as they supported the French companies, but it wasn't bad. In the audiences in Montreal theatres, was there any crossover at all? Did any of the, how many French-speaking Quebecers would come to the Centre and how many English speakers would go to? Uh, very few theater? from the French side. When we had a play that spoke more generously to the French side, yes, we'd get a, maybe a good review in the press or the Devoir. Belkinville? Yeah, Belkinville. But the yes, first play. yes, it's, that's right, the first bilingual play in Quebec. By David Fenario. By David Fenario. That, by the end of its tenure, its life, was attracting almost half the audience being French. That's, yes, that broke through the barrier, but very few others, very few others. And it was very difficult for me to, 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 to follow that up. I thought, surely here we have a recipe of success, a French Canadian, a, a, a play that speaks, that, that has both languages in it. Surely we could find other plays, similarly, would tell a, a story that would involve both. I couldn't find it for life or money. I, 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 you think you'd take a standard play and adapt it to both languages, but it looked forced. Mm. I would speak to playwrights and suggest ideas, and they never quite came to fruition. We never followed it up with a similar experience, a similar product. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very sad that I thought we were kicking off a new wave of theatre. I want to talk a bit about Afro Fugar. Yep. In that he's a South African writer yep. who you brought to Montreal. Early, yeah. Early on, before these writers are being brought to other theatres. I mean, in, you did introduce them to Canadian theatre, did you not? I also introduced them to North American theatre. His plays had not been done in the States until we did them here. So, not what impulse as an artistic director made you reach for a South African writer? Ah, well, I saw his play at the Royal Court first. I never saw him in South Africa when I was there, and it was, he hadn't been, he wasn't doing his rounds the time I left. So I saw it at the Royal Court. I saw Cesar Barnes, is dead. I saw uh, The Island, and probably another one or two plays. And, uh, oh my God, it was, it was incredible that here we have a South African playwright of that stature. So naturally, when I had a venue, as soon as I could, I communicated with Athel and we, we had a, a long relationship. He in fact came and directed and produced A Lesson from Allos, the first production outside of South Africa. 19... Oh my God. 70s. In the 70s, yeah. And I played the lead in that. And the, the origins of that play have a Canadian source. The story is of a man who was betrayed by his comrades and he withdraws into himself. And Ethel knew this man, based on a real story. He went to visit him. And this man had concreted over his entire garden. And Ethel said, why? He said, because I, 
I don't trust anything anymore. I don't trust even my plants to grow. Well, he actually said that in so many words, I don't know. But the, 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 the lesson was obvious, and it chilled Atoll to the bones. He wanted to tell this man's story on the stage, but that, that image was too negative. And he had come to Canada, and he had been to Regina to see uh, two actors rehearsing uh, 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 Banzi, uh, the island. They were playing, they were playing Banzi at the Globe. And he went there to spend some days with them to help them in the rehearsal. And on the way back, the plane landed in Winnipeg, and he told me the story. He looked out of the window as the plane came down, and he saw what was the prairies, but he saw the Karoo, which is that big desert section of South Africa, which occupies the whole center of the country. It was flat, as the Karoo was flat. And what he saw in the Karoo was the aloe growing up, which is the plant of the Karoo. You didn't see the wheat of the prairies. Maybe it wasn't the right season. But what came to mind was the aloe. So the, the man in the play withdraws from the political arena because he is betrayed. And he starts to grow aloes, which are a symbol of endurance in the worst of hardships. They survive all climates. So you have an image of survival and endurance. And in discovering that, he discovered his play. And so there is a Canadian element in that play. And uh, he went, he was right, he got the idea while he was here, but he never told me about it. He went back to South Africa. He wanted me to do his play Demetos, which is the one non-South African based play, which Paul Schofield had done and failed in. And I said, as great an actor as I am, I'd seen Paul Schofield fail in this twice, and let's leave it alone. But he then sent me a lesson from Allos, and he came and directed it, and it was fantastic. And why did you think, I know that you, as you say, as an artistic director, you choose works that you're passionate about, but was there a fit between, or, uh, between a play written by an indigenous South African brought to a man who liked to do indigenous Canadian theatre? Well, because, it was a particular that I understood. And I think uh, the universal always lives in the particular. You don't write the universal, you write a particular. And it was a particular that was truthful as far as I could understand. And I could, I could handle that particular because I knew it. I knew South Africa. I could stage those plays, I could direct those plays, I could act in them. Because I could tell that story. Canadian playwrights and Canadian directors would understand the particular of Canadian plays and know how to bring them to life. And we struggle to bring plays from other countries to life when we don't know the particular that well, but we struggle to check of and so on. We try to adapt them and find a particular that we can relate to in those great plays. But the Canadian plays will have people who know how to do them. The South African plays had me, I hope, and so I was able to bring those plays to the experience of our audience. And they started off in some bewilderment. Why are we doing another South African play? Oh, well, it's probably cheaper for Morris than going to South Africa just to do the play. <laughs> and you'll get a South African rush, you know, as high. But then they, they get to love it. And, uh, and so we, we, we performed a service and brought the South African situation to the awareness of, of the Canadian community, I think, in that way and some great theatre, great, great plays. And Errol Slew, who was involved in many of them, was a master. It was really, he's a great actor, a great loss in his death, his early death.